Hey, in the last few weeks we have discussed quite a lot about Chinese drones and there's been quite a lot of interest, so I thought that I could edit together all the material that we have produced uh, in uh, one of those long format videos that many of you actually do appreciate. So, here it is, the zoo of the Chinese drones. Enjoy! It is a dark night and visibility is poor in the Eastern Pacific. A group of U.S. destroyers led by the USS Kidd is training about 200 miles off the Californian coast. So far, it has been a relatively standard operation, but at 10 p.m., everything changes. Lights start appearing around the ship. They keep their distance but move around the vessel and can keep up with the ship's speed. They are visible to optical sensors and the gigantic SPY-1 radar can track them. When one gets a bit closer, the crew gets a glimpse of a quadcopter, but the duration and the speed performances are beyond what can be expected from a commercial drone. The USS Finn, another Arleigh Burke destroyer, reports similar sightings. And then it's the turn of USS Russell and the USS Rafael Pereira to report in. All the ships are now engaged, and their first reaction is to gather all the intelligence possible about these UAVs. What they do not realize immediately is that they are the object of intelligence being gathered. No, I'm not launching a new techno thriller series. What you've just heard is a very short account of what happened to these ships for two nights, the 14th and the 15th of July, 2019. Only after the fact and after a lengthy investigation spanning multiple years, it became clear that the drones were coming from a merchant ship that could be linked to the Chinese armed forces. Well, this link is not 100% sure, but there is a message here. Welcome to the new Cold War. So the Chinese seem to have made a strategic choice to develop their unmanned capabilities. They have invested heavily for over a decade, from cheap and expendable commercial quadcopters to high-altitude long-endurance drones. They also filled the first operational stealth UCAV, the GJ-11 Sharp Sword. It is possible that the GJ-11 was inspired by US drones captured by the Iranians in 2011, but since then the aircraft has evolved a lot and it entered operational service in 2019. For now it can't operate from carriers, but there are definitely plans to create a naval variant to be operated from the Type 003 carrier and potentially from the Type 076 amphibian landing ships. But the GJ-11 is just the tip of the iceberg. The Chinese have funded dozens of varieties of drones and UAVs using their many state-owned corporations that also build their space and missile technology. Moreover, the plan is already building up its capability across the whole spectrum of its military assets. And they are deploying those capabilities on land and at sea. For example, China's second carrier, the Shandong, was spotted on June this year with a small fleet of commercial or commercial derivative drones on its flight deck. And these images really highlight how the People's Liberation Army is increasing its effort to develop various unmanned aircraft, including those that can operate together in networked swarms. If that were not enough, there is now the case of the Zhuhai Yun. The Zhuhai Yun is a 290 foot oceanic research vessel designed to deploy various underwater and aerial drones for various purposes. And this ship is also a drone itself and it can either be remotely controlled by a pilot or can be left to navigate the, the high seas autonomously. In the words of the manufacturer, it is the world's first intelligent mothership. And though Beijing officially described that mothership as a maritime research tool, 
Press News acknowledged that the vessel hosts some military capabilities that can intercept, besiege and expel invasive targets, whatever this means. What matters is that there is nothing like this in American or Western availability. This effort is becoming to affect the never-ending game played by modern military forces. Beyond the 2019 case that we have already described, that anyway is not officially attributed to the Chinese, there have been plenty of other examples. In August 2021, the Japanese Self-Defense Force led several fighter shorties intercept PLA's drones caught flying south of Okinawa. The drones were of the class of the American Predators or Reapers and they were believed to be collecting intelligence in the waters of the Miyako Strait. It is a critical point of entry to the Pacific and it has been the theater of increasing Chinese activity. These adversary drones are meant to stimulate America's most capable air defenses and those of the Allies as well to collect electronic intelligence of an extremely high quality. And by gathering this intelligence, then countermeasures can be developed. Tactics can be developed to disrupt or justify them. Moreover, capabilities can be estimated and eventually cloned, and tactics can be recorded and exploited. Drones like those of 2019 or 2021 are sucking up or helping another nearby platform to suck up a lot of sensitive information about potential opponents. These drones were baiting US or Japanese assets, gathering intelligence about their response or lack thereof for future actions that, well, we all hope are never going to happen. And by the way, a ship's or an aircraft electronic signature is one of the critical pieces of information that are required to successfully engage the asset. It is so because it can guarantee a certain identification before opening fire. This fixes the IFF problem, which is the main problem of modern, long-range, distributed, network-centric, multi-domain warfare. I think that nothing epitomizes the Chinese effort like this picture. This is what is believed to be a satellite image that appeared on the Chinese internet in December 2019. This is the Malans Air Base Apron, the Chinese center for developing UAVs. As you can see, there is everything there. There are large, long-range, high-altitude vehicles. There are medium-sized drones that are relevant uh, in a tactical or operational context. There are small drones that are supposed to operate in swarms. There are unmanned helicopters and there are UCAVs and so on and so on and so on. And this is just a part of the development going on in China. We will not go through all of them in detail. Today, this was just an overview video. This is just the beginning beginning of a series that probably will keep us occupied on and off for a very long time. The point that I wanted to make is that it is safe, at least for me, to say that the Chinese are speeding ahead of the West in UAVs and UCAV development. So this is something that is definitely worth learning about. Anyway, feel free to draw your own conclusions and let me know in the comments below. They are open for everyone who has something to say. When I saw this photo for the first time, well, my reaction was, yeah, I thought it was just another development in the Chinese drones and UCAV space. 
Something that happens way too fast and way too often. You just get desensitized after a while. The Chinese describe it as a high performance unmanned surveillance aircraft. Yes, interesting, but that's not something that we haven't seen already, so yeah, let's move on. However, something wasn't right. I had the sensation that I was missing something important to understand the Chinese strategy. And then, one day, I suddenly realized. I realized that if I was right, they just found a way to put everyone else in big trouble. WZ-8 was presented during a parade in 2019 and it made waves. In fact, it wasn't a mock-up, it was the real thing. The two units being shown were undoubtedly real vehicles. So it is an unmanned, pure delta wing aircraft with a razor-thin leading edge. That's the most classic of the delta wings, and delta wings are one of the marvel of aerodynamics. It is very simple and streamlined, and it has quite a beautiful line. features two vertical surfaces at the wingtip, the horizontal control surface is seen quite conventional with the two moving parts which are classic for the delta wing. And even the construction is nothing special because uh, it is a conventional metallic riveted structure. Propulsion is provided by two small liquid fuel rocket engines. They seem like two separate engines and not just one engine with two nozzles because there are two pumps exhaust, or at least that's what they seem to be. The size is quite small, it's estimated to be 11.5 meters in length, with a wingspan of 6.7 meters. Guys and metric, get used to it. And the Chinese presented it as a reconnaissance aircraft. High supersonic reconnaissance aircrafts are, well, nothing new. The SR-71 is still present in everyone's memory and Lockheed Martin is working on the SR-72, or at least so it seems. Built today, it's not sophisticated technology, particularly if you're using rocket engines. Provided that the vehicle is designed to be intrinsically stable, even guidance is not really a problem today. The WZ-8 seems to have what it looks like a nice satellite antenna opening on top of the fuselage, and in the worst case, pre-programmed flight paths have been flown since the 50s. The two vehicles shown at the parade don't show any specific payload, but it is easy to imagine that installing, for example, a radar is not terribly difficult. It will still require some clever power generation source, but still nothing too much out of the ordinary. So I sort of forgot that vehicle. But then, in December 2021, I read an article that sort of left me perplexed. In an analysis that appeared on Military Watch, the aircraft was reported to be capable of loitering, also to be hypersonic, reaching a top speed of Mach 7 which is low hypersonic, but definitely hypersonic. And that, I thought it was weird. In the article, no source was mentioned for these data, so I imagine it was some intelligence officer. Well, if this is the case, I am completely wrong and what follows is irrelevant. Loitering and hypersonic, or in general high Mach number, don't go well together. The SR-71 cruising at Mach 3.2 had a turning radius of hundreds of kilometers. But I think there is another and more compelling reason to doubt the hypersonic claim. I looked for a picture of the aircraft from the top and then I measured the angle between the two leading edges. Then I halved the angle because the aircraft is obviously symmetric. The corresponding Mach number that I found was 2.85, which is fast, but not hypersonic. I assumed that the aircraft was flying at 25,000 meters, about the same as the SR-71. At that height, 
in standard atmosphere, the speed of sound is 299 meters per second, in old money 1660 knots, which is very fast but not hypersonic and slower than some Western air to air or surface to air missiles. The WZ 8 would be a very difficult target, but not 100% impossible. Why I say so? Well, in front of everybody traveling at supersonic speed, there is a cone, which is called the Mach cone, formed by a conical shockwave. And the shockwave is just a surface where the airflow slows abruptly, releasing quite a lot of heat. The inclination of the shockwave is the Mach angle. We discussed all of this in the hypersonic series, so as usual, links above and below. As the aircraft progressively accelerates, the Mach cone gets narrower, the angle decreases. At some point, the shock waves will touch the aircraft leading edge. And for the WZ-8, this should happen around Mach 2.85. Now, what happens if the aircraft accelerates? Well, the parts that now fall outside of the main shock wave will start generating their own shocks, but what's most important is that the main shock wave is going to interfere with the wings. But also the control surfaces are blanketed by the shock waves and this could potentially create some nasty consequences. So it's not an ideal condition and you would rather avoid, but in the past there have been several designs that flew exactly in these conditions. For example, the B-58 was one of those. So with an adequate aerodynamic design, there is no reason why the aircraft couldn't fly faster, save for a problem. At nearly hypersonic speed, shocks interfering with the aircraft structure tend to do stuff like this. These are pictures of the famous experimental aircraft X-15, and these are the effects of secondary shocks interfering with the structure. The heat released by the flow going through the shock transition is such that it can easily devastate a structure which is not adequately shielded with materials like steel or titanium. And even with those, it's, well, complicated. And by the way, the top speed reached by the X-15 was Mach 6.74, which is exactly in the bracket that has been reported for the WZ-8. From the pictures, the aircraft doesn't seem to have any protections, save a small shiny metallic nose. It could be faster than Mach 2.85 and probably is, but I would really be surprised if it was faster than Mach 2.85. 3.5, give or take. But there is another detail that doesn't seem aligned with the hypersonic speeds. Look at the vertical surfaces. They seem to have a pretty ordinary aerodynamic profile. In hypersonic missiles or aircraft, those surfaces tend to be triangular in section or sort of very elongated lozenges. The reason is well complicated and it is explained in some details in the hypersonic series. In any case, these vertical surfaces don't seem adequate to hypersonic flight. Maybe the hypersonic speed has been really observed and there are factors at play that I don't know. But if it's not the case, then I really don't understand what an airplane like this is for. The common interpretation goes like this, since reconnaissance satellites are quite vulnerable and there are a few countries that actually have either hard or soft kill capabilities against them, then a high-speed rocket-powered drone could execute some sprints above an area that you want to attack, acquire the information and then glide back to the base. And obviously reconnaissance is the fundamental part of every kill chain. And for China, we can imagine that it is extremely important for them to build a kill chain for their anti-ship ballistic missiles. But now you can see a problem coming. Rocket engines have a very short burn time. They have high specific impulse, they can push you very fast, but their thrust won't last long. If we accept that the aircraft can effectively fly at Mach 2.85 and we hypothesize a burn time of 10 minutes, which is very generous, 
the numbers that we get are not very encouraging. The aircraft is air launched by an H6 bomber and the bomber will likely won't be capable to go too far out at sea if the airspace is somewhat contested. Then once released the WZ-8 is probably capable of flying a stint of about 500 kilometers at Mach 2.85, ignoring the acceleration time, for sake of simplicity. This means, for example, that it could go across Taiwan and come back. This means that it could start from nearby Hainan, fly above the South China Sea and land in one of those artificial islands that China has built in the area, or nothing else could reach the southern part of Japan, but in that case the aircraft would likely be lost because the gliding range is not enough to come back. And just for the numbers, a delta wing like that should have a glide ratio around 8 to 10 and flying at 25,000 meters. This means a gliding range of about 250 kilometers at best. True, at that speed and that altitude it is definitely not an easy target and the horizon is a whopping 560 kilometers. But that would be hardly usable if the payload was some sort of optical device or even a radar. In fact there is just not enough space for any really powerful optical reconnaissance device or even for a powerful radar. For a radar, yes. For some cameras, yes. Powerful ones, well, probably no. And in an aircraft with rocket motors, there's always the problem of power generation. However, it could make more sense if it was equipped with some passive electronic surveillance systems. That would require way less power and the range would depend probably more from the emissions being received. Moreover, if this is expected to replace satellites in all those cases where the satellites have been disabled, we should also expect that, that also the communication satellites are not going to be available. So the antenna visible at the top of the fuselage won't work. The only way of recovering the information was landing the aircraft back to the base but then in that case you can't do any mission where the aircraft is lost so no long-range missions if I am right the WZ-8 is not really a useful platform to identify carrier group in the middle of the Pacific and pass the targeting to the anti-ship ballistic missiles if my calculations are correct we are left with just one possibility the aircraft that we have seen are still experimental. And honestly, if you consider that they don't have any visible payload, well, this is probably not impossible. And probably the Chinese calling it a reconnaissance aircraft, they have just embellished the picture. A rocket-propelled drone like this should be probably bigger to increase the engine burn time, it should show some sign of a payload and it also shouldn't be that difficult to introduce some stealth features to reduce the RCS. So it is well possible that the Chinese are developing a rocket propelled reconnaissance drone but if I'm right it seems that they are not there yet. And that was it. I had fun with the calculations, I felt very satisfied and all was well. But something kept going round in circles on the back of my head. When I made the video about the Chinese drones I was reminded obviously of the aircraft but I didn't give it much consideration. Then by pure chance I watched a video on YouTube. And then I understood what the Chinese are doing with this drone. The WZ-8 is a decoy. It is an aeroballistic system designed to fly in the high atmosphere, nearly in space, but in a suborbital trajectory. And it is not stealth and it is conspicuous on radars so that it can't be ignored by a battle group. Consider this scenario. Take a group of WZ-8 and launch them in the generic direction of a carrier group or any other battle group. They will come at a very high altitude and in this case, since the atmosphere will be thin, they will be hypersonic. 
they will show up prominently in radars or infrared sensors and probably the battle group will be forced to turn on the sensors to try to identify the threat and then with a payload of passive sensors they could geolocate the group and relay the position back not to satellite but toward the ballistic missiles flying behind and above them. I know it's a complicated scheme of operations, but time on target wasn't really invented yesterday. The aircraft features an undercarriage because in training you don't want to throw away a drone every time, plus in this way it can also act as a reconnaissance asset where the range is appropriate. And speaking of range, if it is not flying atmospheric, but is flying a suborbital trajectory, then the range will be much more than 500 kilometers, maybe two, three times even more potentially. And that would probably be enough to reach quite deep into the Pacific. Well, maybe you don't even have to throw all of them away because maybe some of them could land on the Solomon Islands. This theory though has a weak point, and that's the reason why many analysts think that the aircraft is for atmospheric flight. There seems to be no way of controlling the aircraft outside of the atmosphere. There are no maneuver thrusters and the nozzles are not gimbaled. Wow. What about reaction wheels? The Chinese know this technology very well, it's totally mainstream technology for satellites. At the end of the day, the aircraft doesn't need a lot of authority. The one thing that it needs to do is just keeping the orientation in space. It doesn't really need to maneuver. As long as the attitude while entering the lower atmosphere is correct so that the aerodynamic control surfaces can pick up the job, then that's all is needed. And there you have it. This is my interpretation. And maybe this video is completely wrong. It's just a pile of rubbish. But what do you think? Well, let me know in the comments below. They are open to everyone. While I was researching my first video about the Chinese drones, I saw this picture. And I thought, what the? Yes, this drone. This drone attracted my attention and Otis too. Ah, oh, Otis, what do you think it is? It is a high altitude, long endurance drone, sir. Yes, of course, look at that wing, but what is it for? It is for electronic intelligence? No, sir. So you do know what is that thing? Yes, sir, it was in the press. The first rumors about Project 973 Divine Eagle by Shenyang Aircraft Corporation emerged in 2012 in a book about Chinese aeronautical history. In May 2015, some pictures and some engineering diagrams were leaked on the Chinese internet. The configuration shown at the time was not the final one, but it made waves because well, it was big and it was very unusual. It didn't took long before some clear pictures emerged from behind the Great Chinese Firewall. First in July 2015 and then in August, leaked pictures were showing the drone parked on the apron and taxing. And it was a shock. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. First, it was enormous. We don't have the exact size, but estimates from the pictures indicate the length between 14.5 and 18 meters and a wingspan between 40 and 50 meters. The American Global Oak, as a comparison, has a wingspan of about 39.9 meters. Unlike the Global Oak though, this one doesn't have a fuselage. It has two fuselages. In fact, the aircraft has two almost identical fuselages. On the back, they are joined by the central section of the wing. On the nose, they are joined by an additional aerodynamic surface that I believe is acting like a classic canard. A 
it is not clear why this solution was chosen. Surely the box formed by the two fuselages and the two aerodynamic surfaces is pretty stiff without requiring too much structural weight. It is a unique solution and I suspect that the reason it was chosen was not aerodynamic nor structural. However, 10 out of 10 for creativity. Sir, we have to complete the video, sir. The engine is likely a turbo fan and it is mounted above the wing between the fuselages. The wing itself has no sweep, but it has a very high aspect ratio, which is typical of high efficiency subsonic wings. The already mentioned Global Oak has a similar wing. The U2 uses the same configuration. Please do not react like this, sir. The prominent tail feature are the two vertical stabilizers. They appear to be quite large if they are compared with the overall size of the aircraft and probably the reason is the very short arm. And this was probably a compromise because they have chosen this very particular general configuration. So we still have a question to answer. Why did they choose this configuration. In the material leaked in 2015, there were pictures of aerodynamic simulations calculated at 25,000 meters of altitude and Mach 0.8. This actually makes the aircraft mission quite clear. Intelligence. The aircraft is painted in green and grey, and this means that either there are two different materials or the Chinese are just fooling us and believing so. Since the former is much more likely, well, it actually seems that the aircraft is covered in big radooms. Well, they're not really domes, but yeah, you, you get it. The original leak was showing up to seven radar either in X-band or UHF, though the most recent pictures don't seem to show as many. This is telling us that the aircraft is probably an OWAX, an unmanned, high altitude, very long endurance OWAX. It could have a satellite dish under the left dome for communications and two radars under the gray areas, probably one for each side. If other leaks are to be believed, it is possible that under those grey areas there is a modified version Chinese JY-26 radar. The JY-26 is a rather peculiar radar. It is a ground-based Haiza radar working in UHF band. These radars operate at low frequency, long wavelengths and they can indeed see stealth aircraft. But, since there is no free lunch, the quality of the radar track is quite s While the distance measure could be quite precise in the order of a few hundred meters, the angular precision is low. And this means that the detected position at long range could literally be off by tenths of kilometers. But, this accuracy can be greatly improved by combining different sensors. And this is probably the mission of the Divine Eagle. In fact, a fleet of these aircraft could complement the ground-based radars and the more conventional OWACs, making an airspace very hard to be penetrated even by very low observability aircraft. According to some observers, the Divine Eagle entered in limited operational service in 2018 and since then it has been observed in several air bases around China. Unfortunately, we don't know how many are in service, we don't know anything about the production plans, we don't know anything about upgrades, basically we don't know anything. 
Yes, the Divine Eagle is a well-preserved secret. Sir, we didn't explain the configuration. Low-frequency radars are large. The frequency at which they operate forces geometric constraints on the antennas. But to carry a big antenna, there are more conventional solutions. It could have been like this, or like this. In the former case, the canoe on top of the fuselage has an adverse effect on the aircraft's longitudinal stability. Of course, it can be corrected, and it works pretty well, but it is a further complication. In the latter option, the position of the wing actually limits the size of the antennas and anyway placing them side by side along the fuselage could create interference and cooling problems. So what I believe the Chinese designers did was to create an unimpeded fuselage side where to host the big radar antenna. And then they split the fuselage in two to have less interference and better thermal management. Of course, if you are transforming an already existing civilian aircraft or a transport aircraft, all these issues can be solved. They have been many times. But in this case, they were starting from scratch. So why bother? Ah, and now it is obvious why the aircraft doesn't have any stealth feature. I don't need to explain this, right? Please let me know in the comments below. The first time I saw the WZ-7 Sword Dragon, I thought, here we go again, the Chinese delivered another world first. And the key question was, why? Why do they need this complexity? Isn't the reason apparent, sir? Uh, no, Otis, this time is not obvious at all. The first news of these drones appears in 2006 when a mock-up was on display at Zhuhai Air Show. The story of the development, though, is not entirely clear. For example, we know that in 2011 it was uh, seen undergoing electromagnetic compatibility tests, but we don't know when the first flight was. We know that serial production started in 2016 and the first units have been deployed in 2021. However, the aircraft has been seen operating even at an earlier date. The WZ-7 has been seen shadowing American ships in the Taiwan Strait, also controlling Korea flying from airfields in the Chinese Liaoning province. More recently, it has been spot entering the Taiwanese air identification zone. All of this because, well, obviously, the Sword Dragon is an intelligence platform. Okay, Otis, what numbers do we have about this drone? As usual, we do not have official figures for Chinese drones, but we rely on partial information collected mainly at air shows or estimates from Western analysts. The aircraft has a takeoff weight of 7,500 kilograms, a payload is 650 kilograms, and a maximum speed is 750 kilometers per hour. The range is estimated to be 7,000 kilometers. The endurance is 10 hours. The engine is a Gizha WP-13 turbojet with 43.1 kN thrust. Well done, thank you, Otis. The aircraft's general configuration is typical of high-altitude, long-endurance, unmanned aerial vehicles. Long and thin wings, a dorsal air intake, a relatively clean and streamlined shape, V-tail, and some minimal stealth features. These are all typical features of an aircraft that is built for range and endurance rather than speed or maneuverability. Navigation sensors seem to be hosted in this canoe-shaped structure at the front of the aircraft. This ponson is the right size and shape for a side-looking airborne radar, probably an AISA one. From the position, we may suppose that it is designed to look down. So this aircraft is likely a radar reconnaissance platform and an electronic intelligence system. This dome on the back could host an optical sensor, but it is most likely another antenna housing. I couldn't find a clear picture, so I'm not sure. 
So far so good, but I think that many among you will be on the edge of the seat about a unique feature of the sword dragon. And I can understand that because the obvious elephant in the room! Sorry, I keep forgetting every time I mention. So we have a big problem, sir. How big? As big as elephant sized objections, sir. Excuse me, excuse me. <sighs> so. Uh, bear with me, okay? Bear with me a minute, just a minute, bear with me. Okay, we are back and now we can finally address the mystery of the very peculiar wing of the WZ-7. In the sources it was sometimes called a phi wing, like the Greek letter. I don't have any specific name for this configuration, so I believe we can adopt it. So it seems to be a tandem wing with a big swept back wing in front and a smaller swept forward wing behind. The first question is, is the aft surface lifting upwards like a wing or downwards like a tail? So from the pictures it is impossible to say. None of the pictures that I could find is close enough to appreciate any detail of the aerofoil. It sort of seems to be symmetric but laminar. But this seems unlikely because a symmetric aerofoil is probably not going to be very efficient. Also, none of the pictures is close enough or from the right angle to assess the difference of the angles of incidence between the two surfaces. A negative angle of attack would be a giveaway of the aft surface acting like a tail, and vice versa. However, we need to consider that the aft surface is affected by the front wing downwash, so its effective angle of attack is reduced. So in the end, the tail could be lifting downward without being twisted too much. However, I believe that the aft surface is lifting. In fact, if we consider the position of the undercarriage, from that we can estimate the rearmost position of the center of gravity. And the center of gravity seems to be closer to the front wing, but between the two surfaces. This would mean that the aft surface would be lifting, but also that the aircraft is intrinsically unstable and this would require fly-by-wire and a flight control system. Why would you do that on an aircraft that doesn't need to be really maneuverable or doesn't have a massive shift of the center of gravity? Well, it beats me. It is more weight, more complexity, more development time. For what? Sorry, sorry, sorry for the interruption. This is the editing us a few days later. I did this analysis again and now I have the impression that probably the center of gravity is slightly ahead of the aerodynamic center. And in this case, the aircraft would be stable. This would mean that if the aft wing is lifting, then the only downward lift is from the V-tail, but it seems too small, so I would expect that the aft wing would be lifting down. So at this point I don't really know what to think. On with the show. So I can't really work out the rationale for such a configuration from an aerodynamic point of view. I'm sure that the designers at Chengdu will have compelling reasons, but I can find them. It is also worth noting that in the most recent photos, these nacelles at the junction of the two surfaces have been introduced in place of vertical surfaces. I believe that these have been introduced because those vertical surfaces were creating at the intersection with the wings a small system of vortices that was probably not giving any real lift benefit, but was just introducing extra drag. It is also worth noting that the aircraft has swept wings, not dissimilar from what you can find on a civilian airliner. So I do expect that the cruise speed is actually a bit above the declared 750 km per hours.
With a wing like that, we may expect it to be around Mach 0.8, that is about 850 km per hour, which is pretty fast for a hail aircraft. Okay, if we can't find a rationale for aerodynamic reasons, maybe there is one for structural reasons. So in flight the wing is bent upwards and the bending moment increases from root to tip in this way. And obviously the wing must be designed to withstand the bending. Upper surface must resist compression, the lower surface must resist traction. The junction of the two wings is probably reducing bending moment on the main wing. And by the way, such an arrangement is pretty common. It happens every time you have a wing-mounted engine. The aft wing will bear its own load, but it also seems to be compressed by the main wing. Such a thin structure being compressed, well, it's not ideal. It's probably prone to instabilities. And considering that, on the horizontal plane, the two wings obviously have an angle. I mean, there's also a torsion that, yeah, it's complex and definitely not ideal load situation. I can see this configuration as a measure for reducing some structural weight, but I'm not entirely sure if this can really be achieved, and it is definitely quite a complicated arrangement. However, the bending of such long wings has never really been a problem. There have been several solutions and it's not particularly difficult to design. Every sport glider has a wing like that. So it's quite difficult to understand why they went to such a length just to make a slightly stiffer and maybe slightly lighter structure. The only real advantage that I can see is that a forward swept wing with the tip captive, like in this case, definitely won't have torsion problems. But even in this case, we have known for decades how to do that using composite materials. So again, it's not clear why the Chinese designers went into these complications, even from a structural point of view. So I really can't find any compelling advantage in this configuration. Maybe it's just me not seeing it. If anyone has a better idea, please let me know in the comments below. If any of the designers is watching this and wants to contact me to explain what happened here, they are welcome. We will go over again this aircraft and we'll see their ideas. Obviously, if it's not classified information. So I suppose that sometimes you should just accept that we are not understanding. Well, at least not entirely. However, this is not the first case that we are covering a very peculiar Chinese drone. And the relative video is going to appear beside me. So if you want to learn more about Chinese drone, Chinese aeronautics and so on, click on them. So if you are still here, thank you very much. And an even bigger thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member or by one-off donations. You can also support the channel by buying a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I have a small percentage, but there is no extra cost for you. So thank you very, very much for watching and see you there.